going through my mind. And Andy finished us up last night um, just talking about like his work on the cross, that he uh, loves to take what is dead and bring it to life. That through the cross he reconciled us um, with God. That he, and, and you know, if you were there, we actually had an opportunity to kind of write out some of those things that we feel like make us distant from God, some of those things we, you know, of sins um, that, that have separated us from him. And we had an opportunity to kind of tack them on to uh, a, a beautiful cross, by the way, that people just did a fantastic job on those paintings. That was, I'm sure that'll be around sometime. You know, if you didn't get to see it, you will. It's gorgeous. Um, but yeah, I left feeling kind of, you know, just a little like, well, I, I've got some things I think I need to think through and think about. Um, and today, we're going to look in Colossians 1. We're going to finish up this passage, and I'll tell you that, that uh, I think it relates directly um, to that kind of, what do we do now? You know, so this is who Jesus is. This is what, like, he wants from our life. But how do we go about doing this? You know, each of these messages, they ended with some pretty big challenges for us. You know, is he the center of your life? Is he the foundation of your life? Is he Lord? Are you selling him short? You know, are you walking in a manner of, like, what he's done for you? Does your life reflect that? Um, these are really big things to think, okay, that, like, I, I want to be on board with that. But what is the, what about the day-to-day? -day? Like, how do I stay faithful to this one? I, I don't know about you, but I know me. I ain't that faithful. You know, like, I'm, I'm not usually someone who, like, I can just commit to the Lord and then every day I'm, I'm in it to win it. You know, sometimes I get selfish. Sometimes I get in a funk, you know. And so, so kind of this passage, I think, today speaks directly to kind of where we go from here. Uh, what does this look like? And I think even if you're, not, um, if you're not a believer and you're thinking, like, okay, I don't even know if I believe that about Jesus, so I'm not sure. Are you saying this isn't, like, I'm just going to check out. This doesn't relate to me. I will tell you the passage we're going to talk about, the truth that we're going to talk about, is, is one that is incredibly central um, to the entire Christian teaching. It's like a fundamental truth. Okay, so, so I think even if you're like just checking things out, uh, this, this passage would be pretty good for you to listen to if you want to know what this whole Jesus thing is about or you, you want to uh, kind of understand the New Testament better. Um, I'll tell you, though, the passage that we're going to talk about today, the finishing up of what Paul's saying here, it, uh, it's going to reveal a pretty, what he refers to as a deep mystery, a hidden secret. This thing that God has, has, has always been true, but he just recently, at the time that this was written, he had just recently revealed it. And it's, he says it's just mind-blowing. Okay? He's, he's really, really excited about it. And I'll tell you, this, some say that this, this truth that we're going to talk about today, um, that Paul calls, some say that it's Paul's like, thesis for all of his teaching. Um, some say that this two-word phrase that I'll tell you about in a minute that kind of represents this could be the summary of Paul's main theological like, push for the Christian life. So some say that's true. Uh, there's this theologian named Charles Hodge. He's like a more recent guy. He wrote a book. He wrote a systematic theology book. I, don't, I haven't read it, and I don't know that I intend to, but I hear he knows what he's talking about. Okay, so you can trust me. You can trust old Hodge. All right, Hodge knows what he's doing. And he said about this truth that we're going to talk about today, this is what he said about it. He said, no doctrine of the Bible relating to the plan of salvation is more plainly taught or more wide-reaching than the thing that we're going to talk about in just a minute. Okay? So I'm just telling you, it's pretty central. And even one author that I'm reading right now, he said that it's one of the most important, yet poorly understood, central teachings in the New Testament. One of the most poor, uh, important, one of the most important, yet poorly understood teachings in the New Testament. Now I know I'm kind of building it up, but I think that's, uh, I think even Paul does it in this passage we're going to read. So I just, I, I just want you to know, like, it's going to be, it's really important what we're talking about this morning. Like, I, I, I think it's, something that's central, but I'll tell you, it is a mystery, and I can't say that I'm, re I'm ready to teach you every little dynamic and aspect of it, because I don't even think Paul would say that he could, and I'm, I'm just starting to really think deeply about this, but I'm going to bring you on the journey with me, okay, and maybe we can all do this as a community together. So, let's read some, some Bible, okay, and then we'll figure out what this is, okay, so, uh, so, so we're going to be in Colossians 1, I'm starting in verse 24, I think we're going to throw it up on the screen, so we'll, we'll read it together, you don't have to read it out loud, don't worry, I'll take care of that. <clears throat> so here's what it says, this is Paul saying, this is, now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you, get out of your way here, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions, for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Okay, now we're going to start building this mystery up. It says, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, 
but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. So he's saying, you know, this thing was kind of hidden, it was kept secret, and now it's revealed to them. God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, that's us, by the way, uh, if you're, well, I, I guess that's an assumption. It's Jew, if you're not Jewish, you're Gentile in this, in this setting, so you might be Jewish. Uh, among the Gentiles, the glorious riches of the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So this is like Mises' statement right here. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what we're going to be really, really anchoring on today. What does this mean? What does that look like for you? Um, what does it look like for the believer? Um, he is the one that we proclaim. And some versions say, actually, this is the, this is the one that we, this is the, the thing that we proclaim. It's just a kind of neutral um, but pronoun. So it could refer to Christ, it could refer to this teaching. Uh, he is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. So he's saying, you know, that basically, he says, I'm okay to be suffering. I'm, I'm fine to be suffering. If you didn't know, Paul is writing this letter from prison. Uh, everything that we studied this weekend, he did not write from, like, the office of the pastor's room. You know, he wrote it in a prison cell because he was, he was put there for preaching what he was preaching. So he wrote this letter from prison, he's suffering, but he says, you know, like, I'm happy to be doing this because I've been given this mission to share this truth with you. Um, and the full truth, but part of it is this mystery that he's revealed, uh, Christ in you. And so if you're taking notes, and I, I tried to actually make a decent outline for you in that uh, little bulletin, all right? If you're taking notes, then I have, I have some things for you. The very first thing is, what is this revealed secret? And there's not like a blank for this, you can just write it. And it is our mystical union with Christ. That sounds really like a Lord of the Rings thing, I know, but I'm going to explain it, okay, so don't worry. Uh, that's, that's usually the term that theologians uh, refer to this kind, of, this kind of teaching that we're talking about, is our mystical union with Christ. Um, so this is, what, this is what he's referring to, okay? And it's a mystery because of a couple things. One, because it wasn't known. So the word mystery kind of revealed, it, it, it uh, indicates something that was like hidden. And, and it was unknown, right? It was there. It didn't, it's not like it didn't exist until now, but it was just hidden. Um, so he's saying this was always part of God's plan. It's a mystery because it was hidden, but it's also a mystery because of a couple things. One, it's Christ in you. So if you were around for the weekend or you know some about Christian teaching, just, I mean, this is Jesus that we're talking about, the one that, like, he made all things. All things were made for him. All things hold together in him. He literally holds all things together. And it's saying that this same Jesus, you know, the one who, who all, was the only one capable, the only one capable of taking our baggage and all the things that separate us from God and putting it on the cross, that Jesus, all, you know, all of who he is, that, that's Jesus, and he dwells in the believer, in this sort of union, this sort of, we don't really know how it operates, but, um, but in this mystical union. Okay, so that's part of the mystery because it's Christ in you, and the other part it mentions is because it's the Gentiles. Because, you know, in the, in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, God was uh, pretty clear that, like, he, he did love all people, he had compassion on all people, but who he really revealed himself to, who he really worked through, um, who he really had contact with and, and some kind of relationship with, was uh, the Jewish people, not the Gentiles so much. They were supposed to kind of keep themselves separate so they could show who they were. So, you know, the fact that, like, when Jesus, like, spoke to a Gentile every now and then, people would be like, oh, holy cow, what is he doing? Did you see that? You know, so that was just for for a Jewish man to even speak to a Gentile. So to say, oh, by the way, God is going to live in the Gentiles. That's a, how how is that even possible? That at this time to a Jewish reader, that would be like almost like I don't know if I can keep reading this. You know, so it's really really a deep mystery for that reason too. So those are a couple of the reasons why it's referred to as a as a mystery. But um, it's the idea that he is. Um, in us, Christ in us. As a believer, that's part of who we are. That's part of who we become. Now, if I took up like um, like Alex here, Alex is a believer. Okay. If I uh, took him and put him on a table and I saw him open, Jesus would just pop out. All right. That's not how it is. You know. So we're not talking about like, hey, I was in here the whole time. You know. So that's not like that's not the kind of thing we're talking about. This is a very it's on a mysterious spiritual level that there's some kind of intertwining. There's some kind of uh, new mis like union. It is mystical. That's the, I, I like that they use that word. I know it's it really does sound like a Tolkien novel or whatever, but like that's the case. It is it is what what what's what it's referred to. Okay, and this mystery, uh, Paul, it's woven through this very passage. Okay, it's like a, a fundamental assumption of Paul that this is part of the believer's identity. I'll show you. Let's put the passage back up from the beginning. 
Just a couple things to know, okay? He says, uh, I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's affliction. So he has this idea that his suffering is somehow intimately related, connected to Christ's suffering. Like, the suffering that he does for Christ is Christ's suffering. And that the assumption there is that there, there is a union that he shares with Christ. So that his suffering is my suffering, my suffering is your suffering. He says, for the sake of his body, which is the church, Paul plainly taught that the church, a.k.a., hey, everybody, that's us, all right? Not, you know, that's us. And the church at large, the believers out there, that we are actually the body of Christ. He didn't, I mean, he did use this a lot of times as a metaphor to talk about like, the different parts of things. But then he, like, he literally said, this is who we are. We are, like, Christ is in us. And he's in, you know, he's in me, he's in you, he's in you, he's in you. And together, like, we are the body of Christ. So this is like, there's a, a fundamental assumption that he is intertwined, he's connected, he's in the believer and the collection of believers. The church there, it, it, it means, like, not a building, you know, it's not referring to a structure, I know you know this, but the word is ecclesia, and it means, like, those who have been called out. It's like the called out ones, okay? Um, so that's, that's us. Those are the people who've kind of been called out from the world and are now one, united with Christ, that we are actually his body. Uh, moving on, I mean, he, he obviously, you can go to the next one, can it? He says, like, he says it plainly, this mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We'll talk about that second sentence later. So that's, that's just like plainly says it. That's not even like a hint at it. Uh, and then even at the end, he says he's striving to do this, strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Uh, the, the, this energy or this power is referred to as it's Christ's power that's working in me. So there's an assumption again right there. Okay, so even just in this one passage, he kind of like un maybe unintentionally references this truth four times. And then in the New Testament, it's like 200 plus times. Paul talks about our union with Christ and how there's, a, there's an assumption that we're in him and he's in us. And that is like how the believer operates and lives, how we manage to live the life that he's called us to live. This is not an on-your-own thing. It's an assumption that he's in you, working in you. This is who you are. Now, I want to actually talk a little bit more about it before we move on to the hope and glory part. And um, there's a really great passage in John 14. And actually, if you want to flip there, if you follow along, or I'll have it on the board. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty solid uh, teaching. And one of the first times that this union with Christ and the new believers uh, is mentioned, and Jesus actually talks. So we're going to be in John 14, verses 15 through 23. You can write it down or whatever. But this is what it says. Jesus is talking to the, the disciples and believers at a time. He says, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. That's just, we're going to unpack that in a minute, because what does that even mean? Okay. <laughs> Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. And then Judas, not Judas Iscariot. I think Judas, the other Judas, like, demanded that that be written every time. It's like, just don't let them confuse me with that. You know, well, whatever. Okay, so it's like, then Judas, not Judas Iscariot. Don't worry. Said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and then we, this is interesting, even we, he says, as if he and the Father will come to them and make our home with them. One of the first times this is really, really spoken about that Jesus, and, and this is a really huge, huge passage. Um, and and I, I don't know what they were thinking when they heard it, that he's going to come, he's going to send this helper. First he's referring to it as his helper or this advocate that's going to come and live with you, that you won't be alone. But then he starts saying that it's him. And then he starts saying that it's him and the Father, you know? So who is it? Is it this advocate, this spirit of truth? Is it Jesus? Is it the Father? Well, you know, and that's kind of refers to the doctrine of the Trinity that we believe that there, there are three, you know, unique, <coughs> sort of distinct, but also at the same time, one God. And that God lives in the believer, in dwells, makes their home, makes their dwelling with him. This verse right here, um, on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Okay, that's a lot. That's a whole lot. 
So I brought, uh, I brought a demonstration because I'm a visual guy. I think that helps. And someone did this once for me and it was, it was really helpful. So, oh, those are all going <laughs> to hulk it. No, it's fine. I can leave it right here. Okay, I just got to sure, separate this out. Sure. So we'll start with, with, uh, with you because I think that's pretty helpful. Okay, so this is you. Oh, can you put that back up to me? It's less it's like, an, oh, great, thank you. All right, uh, so on that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. So we'll take this from the, this is you, okay, as a believer, right? Uh, and you are in Christ. Okay? In Christ, okay? Now, uh, right there, that's what it looks like, okay? Manila folder system, I like it. All right? Uh, but, uh, you know, this is, this, is, this is also part of the union, the mystical union that we talk about. A lot of times we do talk about, like, the spirit dwelling in us, but in the New Testament there's this concept of also you being in Christ. And this is, like, I don't know if it's exactly the same thing, but it still refers to this, un this mystical union that we have with Christ. Over 200 times in the New Testament, the, the phrase, in Christ, is discussed. So that's the one that people say is Paul's, like, central teaching is this, that all these things, these blessings or these truths about us, if we are in Christ, okay, and that's that's a, a that's a, a spiritual kind of union that we're discussing. Okay, so and Jesus even refers to these both at the same time. So you are in Christ. So you will realize that you know that uh, I am in you, and then you are in me. Uh, so at the same time, also, I should have done this one first. There's you again. Remember, okay. So Christ is in you. Let me get it right there. Okay. Christ is in you and you are in Christ. I don't even know where you are anymore. <laughs> you know? You're, you're in there. Okay? And then it starts out with saying, I'm in the Father. I gave him the V. You know? That was important. So, not any Father. Not just any Father. Okay? Uh, you're in the... And Christ is in the Father. That's you. You know? Uh... Right there. Where, where are you? I don't even know. Where are we? You know? I, don't, I can't imagine a more secure place to be, uh, a, more, a more fixed, safe place to be, than, you know, Christ is in you, you are in Christ, Christ is in the Father. No, I don't, this is just a silly fold here, okay? And this doesn't this isn't really mean anything, except to say, like, we, and the believer, this is a complete redefinition of identity. You know, there's, the, I, can't, I can't explain it, I can't discuss it, uh, I can't spell it out for you. I can just say that you are held in a, in a place that is so intimately acquainted with who God is uh, that I can't put words to it. I can do this dumb thing in the folders, but you know, uh, this is this is a, a kind of reshaping. You know, that, 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 that as a believer, Chris said this the other day about yesterday, just yesterday, about Jesus. Uh, that you know, a lot of times, like, oh, we use him for kind of salvation. We think about Jesus as salvation, and we kind of walk on from there. And I think that's true for the believer a lot of times, is you can think like, oh, well, you, you know, I've accepted the gospel, and now, moving forward, this life is just me, mine to figure out, you know. Uh, I guess I've got to, like, keep these rules or, or figure out how to do them on my own now. Like, he's got me taken care of for heaven or whatever, you know. Um, but the rest is kind of up to me. And that's just so, that's just a big lie. It's a big kind of lie. Yeah, this, is, this is your life now in Christ, in Christ in you, and you both in the Father. And really, the Father is in there, too, in, in you. You know, it's like a lie. Um, but but this, is, this is the life that we live now. So you're not in it alone by any means, okay? It's not up to you anymore. Uh, this, is, this is where you are. So if you're, if you're filling in a blank, it's uh, Christ is in us and we are in Christ. Both of these refer to the mystical union that we have with Christ. So this is just not a change, you know, to become a believer, just to, be, just to really nail this home one more time, is not just a change in beliefs. It's not just a, a change in preference of ideology. It's not even just a change in behavior. Oh, I'm going to keep these rules anymore. This is a, a dramatic change in identity. That you are in Christ, and there are things that are true about those that are in Christ that you can't find anywhere else. And that's, that you have access to that. You know, remarkable truths. Um, it says that Christ in you, the hope of glory. Anybody know that song? I think we're going to sing it today, right? I don't want to give away any surprises. Uh, but uh, I don't know if I want to do that. Sorry. Uh, but uh, it's, you know, the, there's a song, and, the, and, and the, it's just, it's, the chorus is just right from here. I don't know, the bridge, I guess. I don't know, it's a bridge? Bridge. It's a bridge. It's a bridge. Christ, uh, Christ in me, Christ in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Uh, and I always sing that, and I, I love the Christ in me part. Every time I sing the hope of glory, I'm like, I don't really know what that means, but it sounds great. You know, so I'll just sing that too. 
you know, the hope of glory, what does that even mean? Okay, people debate on it, but there's three things, three components I think I'd like to just point out really quickly, okay? One is there's um, the hope, and if you can hit the next one, Janet. Oh yeah, that's right, hope of glory, that's your, that's your blank, you probably want that. Thanks, Janet, thanks for thinking that. Um, hope for our position with God, you can just write position, if you want position. Fancy word is justification, if you want fancy word, theological word is justification. Romans 8, 1 says, now there is no condemnation for those who are, hit me, in Christ. in Christ. There is now no condemnation for those who are hidden. In Christ. In Christ. Okay. So there's hope for your position. You're not you don't have to worry about like what is God what does God feel about you? What um, what makes what makes you acceptable to him. This is you know, this is uh this is what he sees right there. For those who are in Christ. That's what he sees. So there's there's a lot of hope there. Okay, that's you don't really have to worry so much about that. Uh, the next one is that there, there's hope for your maturity, uh, or, or if you want a fancy theological word, your sanctification, okay? And that's like, you know, uh, us becoming more like God moving forward. Um, and this is, this is a big area where I think personally, I often feel like this one's on me, you know? He takes care of my position with him, but then this, the, the maturity part, that's up to me, I have to work really hard for that. But even, even, even throughout the entire New Testament, it's very clear that this is how that happens. You know, not, not some, I mean, I'm not saying that there isn't any effort or work involved, but there's no earning. Okay, that's, that's very clear. This is, this is one verse I found. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you might participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. He gives you, in Christ, He gives you everything you need. He gives you everything you need uh, for a godly life. He gives you everything you need to kind of escape the corruption that is caused by evil desires in the world. He gives you everything you need to follow Him. In Christ. Okay, that's not, you don't have to read books for that. I mean, one in particular. Uh, but, but outside of that, okay. He, he gives you what you need. Um, that's a work that He does. And, I, I, and it's a partnership, I think. This is not from the Bible. Okay, this is from my mouth, right? I think it's a partnership of like, you know, you have to be striving for, for, for godly maturity. But he gives you what you need, okay? I've seen person after person slash myself just be transformed from things that I thought I would never do or want to do, that, that these things are actually desires in my life, okay? I've seen people around here, uh, some of you sitting here, that at one point you were just a big ball of flaky. That's all you were, okay? You know, you didn't, you didn't, I mean, I was in this too, okay? Let me tell you who I was as a freshman. I'll, I mean, and I'm going to say what I am now, and you're like, are you sure that's changed craft? But trust me, <laughs> if you saw me at 18, or you, you have no idea. All I wanted was attention. That's it, okay? When I was at, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm in Christ, dang it, leave me alone. <laughs> when I was in a small group, I didn't think a word about what anyone else was saying. Didn't even listen to it, okay? Not a word. Uh, I, I just thought about the next thing I was going to say, how I was going to get some laughs, how I was going to get people to think I was spiritual. Okay, not a word. Sorry if you were in my... Sorry. Sorry. I didn't care what you had to say. Probably. All right? Sorry. It's just the truth, all right? Uh, but, but what God has done in me, okay? I didn't, I didn't read some book on listening. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't set a goal to be a better listener. I just, like, God worked in me. Christ in me has made me someone, and I'm, I'm on this... I struggle. Okay, I'm not saying I got this down pat, but I can tell you that in a small group, I really, really care about what other people are going to say. Uh, sometimes I've even learned to hold back just so I can listen. So, and that, for me, you don't even know what kind of amount of decline that is. When I have something to say, for, like, I'm telling you, that's not just like something I've worked for. That, uh, that I really, really care about what people have to say. I really care about what's going on in their life. I get more out of what I hear from others than what I have discerned from the truth myself or what I want to share. Um, given any small group. And I'm telling you that's a small example, but I'm just, that's like, that's a big thing that Christ did in me. Okay. And, uh, and I can tell lots of good ones on you out there, all right, but I'll, I'll put myself on the hot seat, as it was referred to. Uh, but anyways, yeah, so there's hope for our maturity, okay? Christ in us is what produces real change. And then there's hope for our future. Colossians 3, 3 through 4 says, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That's what we're talking about right there. Okay. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. A hope of glory. 
uh, I'm going to share a quick thing about this is, you know, uh, the, the Holy Spirit often is referred, Christ in us is often referred to as a down payment for our faith, that, that we have this abundant life in Him now, and that's just a taste. Right? That's just a, it's a guarantee for what we will have in the future, in a future life. Um, I, you know, the song, uh, sometimes, uh, the song, uh, How He Loves. Yeah, you know that one, right? Yeah, of course you do. Yeah. Uh, I really liked it the first time I heard it, and then uh, it just got played a lot. Not here, not, not here, just in general. <laughs> just in general. I don't think it was played too much here. Uh, but, you know, people like it. It's on, I, you know, it's on the radio a lot. It's on uh, Facebook. Uh, and then I heard that daggum story about it. You know, which I think he said basically like, uh, and you, I might have this wrong, but I'll tell you what I think, but that's what matters to the sermon anyways, okay? Is it basically like it was written to be about his friend going to heaven, right? Experiencing Christ there, right? And his friend is kind of like sending the message back. Um, and when I heard that, that just changed the way I thought about it entirely. You know, because uh, when, I, when I sing it, I often think about some people that I love a whole lot um, who have passed on. Uh, and uh, I think about just, you know, I'll be a little bit more honest. Like, I think about my dad. Um, I think about him being with Jesus and, and looking back and saying, like, oh, you have no idea how much he loves us, you know, and I, I get, um, every now and then I get a moment where I think, where I get hit with how, with his kind of love, and that's something I think he does in us, he shows us through his, through his presence in us, and I think, if this is what I think now, you know, so trapped by all this stuff, like, uh, I just, I, we just know the slightest bit, you know, of who he is, we just have the tiniest, tiniest aspect of the kind of love that he has for us, the kind of glory he has. Uh, and that's through him and us, but, but we have a hope for a future uh, where that's just, the, that's just a glimpse of what we will have. And the, the spirit in us is a hope of that future glory. So those are some things you can think about now when you sing the hope and glory part. Okay, and maybe it'll mean a little bit more something if you're like me. Okay. Uh, but I, I really, just, just um, moving forward, uh, I think that, so this is, you know, so we have the hope of glory, the Christ in us. But I'll be honest with you, sometimes I feel a little bit of a disconnect. Uh, because I think, okay, well this is, what, this is what life is. This is what the Bible says we have. This is what Paul preached that we are now. Uh, but then I also know when I'm living every day, you know, and sometimes it doesn't really seem to fit exactly like <laughs> I thought it should. Uh, so what, what's, what's the disconnect? Why, uh, why do I feel as if um, sometimes... Like, this is what I am, but sometimes this is what it seems like, you know. Uh, and so what's, what's that coming from, you know? Sorry, sorry, everybody. Yeah, it's really powerful for these people. <laughs> uh, but sometimes it just, it feels like it's, uh, it's just me. Um, and, you know, like, I'm, I'm on this journey right now where I'm thinking about this a little bit more, uh, and... I really want to, I really, I really want to uh, know this truth in a deep way. But I think there's a lot of lies out there that are going to try to. I, I think that there is a liar out there that's going to try to tell you that this is this is you. You know, uh, that you're alone, uh, that you have to do all this on your own, and you know you don't really do a very good job of that. So it's probably never really going to happen. Uh, trying to tell you that you're probably never really good enough to live up to the dreams that you. Have, that you're probably never really going to tackle that sin issue in your life. That it's probably it's probably always going to have power over you. You know, you might have had like a good month, but it's going to, you know, it's just you. Um, but then I think that there's truth. You know, that well, that's actually uh, that's actually a lie. You know, uh, that this is who you are. Uh, so like, how to sink that in to the head and the heart? Um, a few things I, I think. The main, the main thesis of this would be uh, we need to believe in and become who we are in Christ. Um, so, you know, the, the, the takeaway is not, well, you need to be more and, you know, you need to be, be this, become this, okay? Uh, and, and that's, if you're not this, you need to be this, because Jesus already did this for you. If you're a believer, this is who you are. So it's more of like waking up, you know, I think is what we need. I think, I think we need to believe that this is who we are. And start start walking in it, but this is this is where you're at right here. Um, so believe in it and become who you are. And these three things that I kind of thought that I'm I'm kind of challenging myself to, and I'm going to 
throw a challenge out your way. Uh, the, the, the three are truth. Uh, the, the New Testament is just crawling with truths about who you are in Christ. Okay? And they will blow your mind. Okay, I'm dead serious. Uh, there's stuff in there saying who you are right now. And you're going to read it and you're going to think, no, I, I'm supposed to work for that, aren't I? And it's going to say, no, 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 you're, that's already who you are. This is who God sees you to be, and that means that's who you are. Okay? It's not like God has Wonka vision on or something like that, okay? And he just sees things in a different way. What he sees is what it is, because that's who he is. So that's who you are. So I think that we need a, a lot of that. It says that it's one of the most widely taught, but poorly understood truths in the New Testament. So I think we can sure use to understand it better. I think we need to be digging into the Word as a believer, not just a, a shallow pass-through uh, of verses, but I think we need to be digging in and seeing who we are in God's Word, on your own, even, okay? Now, I'd love that you listen to me. I think that's great. I love being listened to. But you need to be digging in on your own. We need to be digging in on our own to this truth. Uh, I think uh, connection. And I mean by that, like, connection to God. I think that we need to allow Him space in our day. And this is one that I, and when I say I was convicted of the advance, this was like, ah, you know. I need to allow God time to speak to me. I need to set aside time to, to meet with Jesus and allow Him to be, you know, working in me. If you remember that passage we taught a while back that said that, uh, that you know, don't, don't uh, get filled up on wine, uh, uh, like the drunkard's do or whatever it says, but rather... Uh, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, you know, he knows, Paul knows you already have it, but he's saying, let, it, let Christ really fill you up. Let, let him control you. Let him have your life. And I think that that's time and connection with him. And then lastly, I would say sharing uh, with one another. You know, uh, the, Paul, Paul is very, very clearly teaches that this isn't a union that we just, really, it shouldn't be you, it should be us in there. This isn't just a union that we have all by ourselves, but that we share this together. You know, we share it together. Uh, Christ is in Anna, Christ is in me. Uh, I am in Christ, Anna is in Christ, and we are members, Paul says, of one another. Um, so we have, a, we have a, the believers have a mystical union with one another. And this is not meant to be lived on an island. Okay, maybe if there's a man on an island or a woman on an island, maybe. But, uh, but we're not. Okay, so, uh, so this is meant to be lived out together. A very, 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 very practical takeaway is uh, I've been a, I've meant to have this printed out. The resource room didn't open until 11 because that's when they open and I'm doing anything wrong. I just want to clarify. I'm just a poor planner is what I mean. Um, but I, I'm going to post for you. on For those of you who like a real tangible, I just want to get your hands on something. Uh, I'm going to post for you at this afternoon five passages. And I think what would be cool is if we took some time this week to just do these three things with them. Okay? So I want you to look at the truth of that passage. It'll be about something about who you are in Christ or what it means to have Christ in you. I want you to look at it, spend some time meditating on it. Okay, set aside some time. Uh, and if you have a reading plan, you're like, that's going to throw off my plan. That's fine. Like, you don't have to do it. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, you could pause your plan. That would be the end of the world, all right? Uh, all right, so, you know, you can, you can spend some time with it. I want you to spend some time connected with Christ about it. I want you to pray to him about it, to say, can you show me what this means? What does it mean that these implications of this truth? And then I want you to share with somebody. What are you learning? What, what does this mean for, for you and what does this mean for us as believers together? Okay? Uh, and and that, maybe that's like a roommate. Maybe that's coffee with a friend. Maybe that's you post what you're learning on our Facebook wall. Okay? We can use modern social technology to have fellowship with one another. Uh, but, I, but I want you to consider these three things with these. I'm just giving you five. Okay, so uh, that's a challenge. You can take it or leave it. No skin off my back. But I wanted to give you something to kind of hang on to. But what I think is, you know, at the end of all this, is there's like a couple options. Uh, if you're not a believer, then, you know, you can look into this. And I think that would be a really good thing. I would say that, you know, if you're not a believer, my challenge to you would be keep spending time with us. All right, because we're supposed to be something different if he's in us and we have this kind of unique bond together. In fact, Jesus said that you would be able to know something that's true about him just from us, the way that we are in union together because of our union in Christ. Um, so if you're not a believer, that's what I would say. Just, just look a little into it and spend time with us and see if there's something a little different. It's a big challenge to some of us, right? Yeah.
Uh, and if you are, uh, then I would say, you know, these are kind of the, what are you going to believe? You know, uh, what, are you, what are you going to really hang on to? Um, and I would, I would just challenge you to say, well, we can live this life where we just keep thinking it's all about us and it's all up to us, or you could just let go of that and realize that it is a lie. I was going to rip this, but it's a little bit more difficult than I intended. <laughs> um, or, uh, you know, or we could believe what's true, you know, what's, what's true for us and our identity in Christ. Okay? Um, so that's, that's, what I, that's what I wanted to say, and I've said it. I'm going to pray now. Okay? Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, Jesus, thank you so much for our identity in you. <coughs> we are in you. Thank you for this, this crazy, mind-blowing unity that we have, God, that, that we have a new identity, that you're in us, we are in you. Together we're in the Father, we are held, we are secure in that place, and that you in us gives us a bright hope, God, a hope for where we stand with you and, and a hope just for, for where we can be, God. And we have the ability to dream big dreams, God, because we're not alone, but it's us plus Jesus, and us plus Jesus can, I think, take on the world. Um, so help us to believe who we already are in you and have confidence in what you can do in us. And uh, thank you for these beautiful people. And, and, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Kill artist Quill for us. We're going to sing these words uh, this morning. Just uh, Christ in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Uh, so now you can just pack some truth behind just those words that we'll sing. Um, and also, if everyone uh, should have a bulletin, uh, if you guys could just pull out the I think pink cards uh, this morning, and just at least write your name down on the staff. We'll pray for you this, uh, this throughout this week. Um, but also, if you have any responses or any uh, prayer requests, just write those on the back. We'll just uh, continue worship this morning. But you guys can go ahead and stand up for no